there. All right, so our first speaker is Linda Cornish, who is the president and founder of the Seafood Nutrition Partnership, which is a nonprofit that works toward improved public health and future food security through sustainable seafood. Through her leadership, the partnership has become her, the trusted voice for seafood nutrition for the industry, as well as the health and nutrition community. She holds an MBA from UCLA and a bachelor's degree in business administration from UC Riverside. And Linda currently lives in Arlington, Virginia with her husband and two terriers. Kimberly Thompson is the Director of Seafood for the Future at the Aquarium of the Pacific. Seafood for the Future helps promote the important role that responsible aquaculture has in meeting the demand for food in a changing climate. She leads efforts to develop and execute science-based communication tools and resources to educate diverse audiences about marine aquaculture. Kim has convened many workshops and forums to facilitate dialogues about these issues and she works closely with NOAA and Sea Grant to integrate science-based marine aquaculture content at aquariums and other formal learning environments. So with that, I'm going to stop talking. Um, I'm going to turn off my webcam and stop sharing my screen. And I'll hand it over to Linda, um, and I'll also pull up that first poll question. Great. Thanks, Maggie. I'm going to share my screen, and uh, hopefully you guys have a chance to also take the first poll question. Okay, well, thanks, Maggie, uh, for having me on your Health Network webinar again. It's nice to see everybody. I think I was on a webinar last year, and so I'm really pleased to be able to share with you the Eat Sleep in America campaign that's currently underway. And uh, so today, what I'd like to go over with you is just an overview of the campaign and our progress to date. And uh, before I turn it over to Kim, I will also go through um, – just uh, some things for us to consider as consumers are changing their behavior drastically during this time. And um, so I think um, as, as uh, Maggie had shared a little bit about my bio, I do want to note that you know, we do have uh, been quarantined here uh, in Arlington, Virginia with my husband and our two Sealyham Terriers. They are 16 years old and uh, they've been eating a diet of salmon kibble their whole lives. So I want to attribute that their long lives are also due to seafood. And so uh, for those of you that don't know um, or haven't heard about Seafood Nutrition Partnership, um, we are a charitable nonprofit, uh, and our whole goal is to help Americans be healthier by empowering seafood consumption through partnerships and collaborations. And so our work can be bucketed into really three main uh, areas. We focus on seafood for nutrition for human health. And so there have been over 40,000 studies since the 1970s about the benefits of eating seafood for reducing chronic disease, such as heart disease, uh, diabetes. And um, also there's a lot of studies on seafood's ability to really reduce the um, uh, the risk of um, other diseases as well, but it has a great benefit for immune support, which is very important for us right now. Our other bucket of work is uh, communications outreach. So we translate the seafood nutrition science for human health, and we equip health and nutrition influencers so that they have the resources to recommend more seafood to their clients and customers. And to date, we have reached more than uh, 26,000 registered dietitians. And so there's about 100,000 registered dietitians in this country, and they are members of the Academy for Nutrition Dietetics. And so, um, you know, dietitians are a very vital part of just health and nutrition information. They work in retail, food service, workplace wellness, um, health care. And so um, by reaching dietitians, they're able to expand our reach much further. As a small nonprofit, our third bucket of work is to work in partnerships. And so we build partnerships to amplify these urgent messages for us to eat seafood for better health. And um, that's a part of the reason why we formed the Eat Seafood America campaign um, so quickly. So um, just a, a, an overview of Eat Seafood America, you know, this is a rapid response consumer-facing campaign, and we are encouraging Americans to buy and eat sustainable seafood so that they can be healthier and to support the U.S. seafood community affected by COVID-19. Um, this is happening from April through July 2020. And, um, you know, 
really this idea came about, you know, when the um, uh, pandemic was happening and we saw that so many of our friends, businesses, donors, um, they were being seriously impacted by the, you know, COVID-19 and, and the restaurant closures and just all the different issues facing America. And so um, I know all of us were rushing to figure out what we all can do to make sure that we can help our seafood community. And uh, so that's when we uh, formed this idea to really put together a call to action for consumers to drive demand to eat seafood and really um, help themselves and help the seafood community. And so this campaign includes a combination of campaign assets and graphics and messages and they're all free to use for consumers and anyone that wants to use this campaign message to utilize it. It includes digital media outreach, public relations outreach, and also earned media. And um, we uh, could not do this without the help of our Seafood for Health Action Coalition. As part of this campaign, uh, we called out to our various friends and partners to join a coalition to meet together um, at least weekly through uh, project work site and also uh, monthly on phone calls to learn about the campaign, understand what we can do with each of our respective networks, and also to amplify each other's messages. And so I want to thank the Seafood for Health Action Coalition for being a part of this effort from the very beginning. I have to say that I'm just so proud of the community that I work in that all of us work in, that when it was time to come together and really help those in our community get through this together, um, everyone said yes. Everyone said, yes, sign me up. Let's, let's do this together. And so the coalition is made up of nonprofits, trade associations, government organizations, really those that are not in the business side, so for us to try and help them overcome the economic crisis that was happening uh, within our industry. So thank you for your help. Um, Kim Thompson from the Aquarium of the Pacific Seafood for the Future is one of the coalition members, and so she will be sharing with you how she's leveraging the Eat Seafood America campaign uh, and amplifying the messages. We're also very thankful for funding support from the following organizations, the Walton Family Foundation, the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, NOAA Fisheries, and the Chilean Salmon Marketing Council. Um, with their support, we're able to fund advertising to target to consumers to buy seafood, and also some television advertising that you'll see later on. And so um, this helps us to increase our reach of consumers beyond just the Seafood for Health Action Coalition, um, but uh, we really thank um, all of our funders for being able to support us in this time. So if you're new to this campaign, um, all of the campaign assets are at eatseafoodamerica.com. It's also available on .org. And you can see on one page why we're doing this campaign and also to make sure that you um, post your photos of your favorite seafood meal on any social channel and tag it with hashtag Eat Seafood America. You can see it um, really from all channels, including Twitter, LinkedIn, um, Facebook, Instagram, also YouTube. And so any channels use the hashtag to show your favorite seafood meal. These are some of the campaign assets. And so we've created a, a grouping of assets. And so they include messages of calling to action the Eat Fish Save 2 Million U.S. Jobs. Um, and then also there's Buy Fish Save, you know, save Jobs. But you know, these campaign assets can be utilized by anyone in the seafood industry or any foodie that wants to support the seafood community. And so you can use this to support your local fishermen, your local seafood farmer, if you um, promote crab or if you like lobster. There's different photos to use, and so we recommend that you use any of these really to um, be able to help support this campaign. And the call to action is um, really simple. It's to eat seafood, buy seafood. And um, right now, there's just a, a lot of ways to buy seafood. You can buy it online, order pickup from different purveyors, restaurants, 
Uh, there's a lot of mail order grocery stores. And what we're seeing a lot right now is um, a lot of seafood companies have pivoted to selling direct to consumers. And so if you want to support them and give them a try, there's a lot of companies that are starting this service. And you can find them when you use the hashtag Eat Seafood America. A lot of companies have been using that hashtag as well. So two, post your meal, tag it with Eat Seafood America, and do it again. Um, really, you're helping to support our seafood community. And what we're asking for everyone to do as they're using this hashtag is to be nice to each other. Really, this is a time to support each other and really support any species, even if they're not your own, to be able to support another um, company's work as well. And so um, I plan to share this, but um, I know we'll share the PowerPoint presentations with you after the, the webinar. And so this is an example of a one-minute news segment that we recorded with um, really TV host and media dietitian Anessa Chumley. She's based in Indianapolis. And so she recorded a couple of videos for us. This one um, is placed after news segments. And so with COVID-19, a lot of news stations are not able to have guests on their show. And so we recorded these so that they can be played um, after a news segment uh, for Nessa to share the Eat Sleep in America message. Um, the second one she did, and uh, this is just a little bit longer, and so um, it's placed with lifestyle segments. And so you think about Good Morning Washington or other morning shows in your city. Um, these are played right now. Both of these videos are being played across the country from Alaska to Florida, and uh, hopefully um, some of you have, have seen these on your own TV stations. And so how are we doing? Um, so this started early April, and uh, to date we've generated 95 million impressions. And uh, there have been over 3,000 social posts. And so thank you for everyone that's using this hashtag. Um, Instagram is a little bit um, more private. And so um, for our reporting tools, they don't show how many people are completely using Instagram. So when you go to Instagram and search the hashtag, there's about 1,300 people that have been using that hashtag. Um, and so these impressions are totaled from the different channels, the social channels, earned media, um, and uh, other ads that are running at the same time. And so I think that with that, there's um, a couple of poll questions that we'd like to, for you to um, fill out at this time. And, um, and I'll ask Maggie to pull them up for you. Yeah, I actually think I can pull up both at once, so you should be seeing two of them here. Um, we'll okay. close them in a few minutes when it looks like a lot of people have um, taken them. Okay. I can Let me know. I don't know, Linda, I don't want to take over your screen, but I want them to see the whole, I don't know if they can see the whole question. So Okay. Do, we, do you need me to unshare my screen? No, it's fine. I just don't want to, like, take over your slides <laughs> with these poll questions. So let me know if um, you want me to move them aside. <laughs> Oh, I can't see them, so yeah. Just um, oh, okay. let's give everyone right, sure. just a, a minute to um, to take the questions. So, what we're interested in the first question that you had at the beginning was I, I, we were interested in knowing um, if you were familiar with the Eat Sleep America campaign before this webinar. And these next two questions, um, really just out of uh, curiosity, um, to know how often sure. you eat seafood and if you've been um, uh, eating more seafood during this time, and I'm so happy to see the chat uh, boxes earlier that a lot of you have been eating a lot of seafood for your quarantine meals. Um, personally, for me, um, you know, one of our local seafood distributors pivoted to um, uh, consumer uh, wholesale during this time, and so I've been having great access to some great seafood. and. Um, one thing that I learned how to do during quarantine is to steam live lobster. And so I've been making um, lobster clam bake, lobster rolls, and uh, it's been fun learning how to just cook more seafood. I'm also trying to shuck more oysters. I'm not very good at shucking oysters, um, but, you know, practice makes perfect, so I'm going to keep trying. Um, but there's just a lot of great options out there. 
And Linda, it looks like there's a comment. Um, someone said there's no options for frequencies between once a month and once a week. So it looks like there's someone who um, eats seafood between that um, once a month and once a week. Oh, I see. Good, good, good point. Because I know that's the uh, yeah one of one of those questions. Okay. Um, it looks like the um, how many. It looks like one of the polls. Uh, how many times did you eat seafood? Is has been taken a lot, so I might um, close that one. And then the, how has your consumption of seafood changed in the last two months? Um, I'll leave that one open for a bit longer. Okay. And is it okay if I continue? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so I, I know a lot of us um, are, you know, focused in communications, and so I want to just highlight the unprecedented consumer behavior change that's happening right now. So, you know, we have, I believe, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to help Americans embrace the vital benefits of sustainable seafood. It's great for our health. It's also great for our planet's health because it's part of a climate-friendly diet. And as we're seeing with COVID-19, it's important for our economy. And so I wanted to share just some data with you. Um, this is uh, some information that, that comes from Accenture, one of the major um, consulting firms. And so um, they did a survey of over 3,000 individuals in 15 global markets. And what they're finding is that consumers expect their shopping habits to change permanently. And so one of the key things that came out of this survey is that they're showing that consumers are prioritizing their health, sustainability, and they want to support the local consumers, like local community and businesses. And so their findings show that 59% um, of those surveyed plan to shop more health consciously, and 54% plan to buy more sustainable choices. And so it's important for us to continue to make sure that we highlight sustainable seafood. And so um, for consumers, and this is part of the same study in this slide, it's really important for companies and organizations to make sure that they have a health strategy as consumers have an ever-increasing focus on health. For the first time, health is not a bad word. It used to be when we asked people to eat healthy, they thought they were going to be eating cardboard and not really great-tasting food. But now there's a renewed um, importance for why healthy is so good for our, our um, immune system. And um, also, as consumers are uh, being more conscious, having a sustainability uh, message is very important in highlighting what the work that, that you're doing. So it's whether it's for-profit businesses or for nonprofits, this is really the time to highlight sustainability and sustainable seafood. And also, as consumers are, are seeking to support local economies, Really highlighting local fish and, and local businesses is really something that we're doing already. And uh, it's good to know that there is a receptivity right now to hear more about it. And so um, really now is a great time to continue highlighting the messages and the work that you're doing. And I feel that this is a great opportunity for Sifu to continue and, um, you know, Messages take several times for it to really stick as well as behavior change. But I think uh, this is an, a really unique time for us. The CEO of um, Taco Bell Parent Young Brands told Wall Street Journal that the three-month period we are going through um, is equivalent to about three years of consumer change wrapped into one quarter. And so having all of us stay at home cooking more is definitely something that you know, we feel will continue to stay even as restaurants start to open up. Um, in the New York Times, many of you probably saw this, there is an article about the quarantine surprise. Americans are cooking more seafood, and it's really been a bright spot for a lot of us to, to see. And, um, you know, I'll show you later, retail sales have really set records in this time as consumers are trying different, different species and different cooking techniques. Um, this is um, data from IRI. They're a major research firm that measures um, retail demand. Um, and so in the presentation that we share with you, there will be a link to this website, IRI. 
um, and you can see this report live for, for yourself. Um, but they were measuring um, how COVID was impacting retail. And as you can see, um, you know, the bottom line is seafood. And since the week ending April 26, seafood has been indexing at about a, above 100 all this time. And so um, it, it's had tremendous growth. So as of a week ending June um, 7th, it's grown 43% year over year. And so seafood has been the fastest growing category in retail. And so um, we want to just make sure that as consumers are building this habit to eat more seafood, and 80 to 90% of, of retail and food service establishments in the country have a sustainable seafood policy in place. And so we want to make sure that they understand that America has great sustainable seafood. I'm seeing your questions very tiny, and so I'm not able to get to them right now, but um, ho hopefully we'll have some time to get to them at the end. Um, and so this is my last slide. I, I do want to um, just encourage us to meet consumers where they are. Right now, they're seeking to strengthen their health and immunity. And we've all seen stories of meat shortages. And so they've opened up consumers' minds about trying different proteins. And so seafood definitely checks that box. A lot of consumers are having cabin fever, and they can't wait to travel again, or they're thinking back to their favorite vacation. And so whatever part of the country you're in, this is a great time to show them your iconic seafood dish from where you are, from around the country. With quarantine fatigue, consumers are seeking comfort food and fun ways to be distracted at home. And so, you know, let's show them different ideas about virtual vacation destinations, um, you know, date nights, cooking together. We have a cooking together series on seafood for health on Instagram. Parents, I, I feel for parents. I mean, they've been homeschooling kids. And also, um, we're not sure if summer camps are going to be open in parts of the country. And so, you know, one way is to also share activities with kids, help them build tacos together with you or make sushi together or shrimp pesto pizza. We've got these great recipes on seafoodnutrition.org for kids. And so it's a great way for them to be able to just learn more about sustainable seafood. Consumers, lastly, want to help with social issues if they can. Um, you know, right now we're facing two viruses. One is COVID-19 and one is racial injustice. And so if there's a way for us to highlight also black-owned businesses, and that's, that's a great way to um, communicate your support for fighting these two viruses. And so um, thank you for this opportunity. I, I think we'll have some time for questions at the end. And I'm going to turn this um, back over to Maggie. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, I think we'll... Um, well, let's see. I think we might ask these questions at the end, Kim, if you want to give your presentation first, and then we'll, we'll have the general Q&A. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, so, First, I want to thank Linda, first of all, for, you know, including Seafood for the Future in this and Maggie and the team at CELC, um, but also thanking Linda for, you know, I, I don't know how familiar everybody on this webinar is with the seafood sector, but uh, it's very fractured, um, and there can be a lot of stone throwing among different segments of the, the industry, so um, I think what Linda has done is really more amazing than many of you probably know. Um, so she just, there's a huge round of applause, um, and I think there's a lot of momentum for stronger collaboration to the future, which is really how we're going to move seafood forward in terms of the hearts and minds of the broader public. So, Linda, thank you. Um, so, you know, we were asked to join to discuss why the aquarium, an ocean conservation organization, got involved in such a broad campaign, right? It, it doesn't quite seem intuitive to some, you know, why we would be engaged when, you know, not all seafood that we're recommending for just broadly saying eat seafood, you know, how do you tell if it's sustainable or not? Um, so before I kind of dive into why we, we got into this, Maggie, can you pull up the polls? Um, and I'm hoping that only those of you who are either CELC members or are an actual educator in the formal informal space will answer this. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm happy that everybody else is on the call, but I think just to not skew the answers, um, so there's two questions. The one is, you know, do you include sustainable seafood in your conservation messaging and education initiatives, yes or no? Um, and then the second question is, do you discuss sustainable seafood in the context of, and then there are several um, options there. So if you wouldn't mind taking a few moments to answer that, we'd be very curious to see um, how our peers in the conservation education community are engaging this topic. Um, so the aquarium, and as you noted from that list that Linda had given, there are a number of conservation organizations involved in this. And there are several reasons for this. I can't speak for every organization, but um, you know, the first and foremost, we wanted to support responsible actors. The bottom line is the sustainable seafood movement has been going on for over 20 years, guys. And you know, a lot of people on this webinar have played a role in that. So a huge round of applause. Thank you, everybody. Um, you know, it's not a perfect scenario. We haven't fixed everything, but at some point we have to throw away the sticks and we have to bring out the carrots. And the bottom line is there are so many fishermen and seafood farmers and many others throughout the seafood supply chain who have been working hard right alongside all of us in the conservation community to try to develop sustainable solutions that are going to result in strong conservation benefits that benefit all of us in society. So, you know, they're really struggling through COVID right now. We know that in the U.S. we have some of the best managed fisheries and farms in the world. You know, it's time, again, to, to throw away the stick and start supporting them with the carrot. Um, and the second is as part of that broader conservation message. You know, Linda brought this up a few times. Uh, sustainability is kind of a hot topic in terms of the, the consumer level. Um, but we know that Responsible seafood is more than just the localized risks and impacts, right, which is where we typically have tended to focus in the conservation community. We also need to take a step back and we need to look at seafood's role in the broader food supply. And we know that it can provide a more stable and resilient source of food in the changing climate. We know that there are certain species and certain types of seafood production that can even provide localized ecosystem benefits. Um, and it can also help to provide a more affordable source of local protein and help uh, economically with those working waterfronts. So there are a lot of really great benefits for society and the environment with responsible seafood. And again, the U.S. has the tools and resources uh, to bring this to bear. So that's why the Ukraine and the Pacific has been involved in this. You know, admittedly, as an institution, we have our Seafood for the Future program. We've been involved and engaged in this discussion for almost 20 years now. Um, it's embedded in our everyday, um, you know, through our exhibits and our programming. Uh, so it is a little easier for us, but I do think there is a lot of room for our colleagues and our peers to get involved in this conversation. So I'm just going to show you a few examples. So our primary uh, participation in the Eat Seafood America campaign was through social media. And I want to give a quick shout out to our science communications fellow, Mackenzie Nelson, who's amazing. And without her, we wouldn't have a social media for Seafood for the Future because, um, as you know, social media is a beast. Um, so Mackenzie's amazing, and she's really kind of beefing up our social media. Um, and I'll get to some work that she's doing with our larger aquarium social media team in a moment. Um, but what we've done, so, you know, through the hashtag Eat Seafood America, you know, this is just pretty low key, right? It doesn't cost us a lot of money. It's just a matter of us creating these posts. There are a couple ways that we participated. The first is we created our own posts. And again, the aquarium has the luxury of having been in this conversation for a long time. We have our Seafood for the Future program. You know, for us, it's pretty easy to create original content. Um, so we have that here. And you see we were also taking advantage of the Eat Seafood America resources that were available. We also leveraged it to promote existing content. You know, we've spent a lot of time, money, and resources on a lot of education outreach materials to promote responsible seafood and responsible aquaculture. Um, so it just was a natural fit to add that Eat Seafood America tag, and it was just another way for us to amplify some of the work that we've already been doing. Um, this actually is a link to um, a resource page that I'll show you in a moment that we created on our website that basically links to local sources where you could buy from direct from local fishermen and local farmers during the COVID crisis and support those who are, you know, trying to build that network of direct to consumer um, in the absence of restaurants. And then the broader aquarium. So Seafood for the Future, we have a relatively small following. Again, as I mentioned, uh, Mackenzie's been doing an amazing job. But we're still relatively new in the social media space. But the aquarium is a, 
the mega star in the social media world. Um, and so again, because we were able to repost some of the content we've already created, it made sense for the aquarium as an institution to then repost. And the beauty of having the aquarium repost outside of seafood for the future is you're reaching a much broader audience than just you know the seafoodies and preaching to the choir. Um, so you know for your institution, you have to decide what's best for you. But you know if you already have existing content. Or as I'll show you in a moment, if you have partnerships with um, other organizations that already have strong content that you trust and you know are are in line with, um, then it makes sense to have your institution uh, reshare that and play a part in that. And so this is an example of some of those organizations. And many of you are probably familiar with them: Fishwives, Seafood Watch, Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, the Nature Conservancy also participated. Uh, Fish Choice is also a piece of this. Um, so as an institution, you know, again, you may not have the resources to have your own sustainable seafood team, but there are other organizations that you're either currently partnered with or maybe you want to try to partner with so that you can then uh, build up a library of messaging and resources that you can then share with greater confidence um, in those messages. So I'll just show you the web page real quick, as I mentioned. Um, so this was just a few guide. So if you want to buy direct from the local fishermen or from the local farmers, um, these are some resources that we created. Um, how do I get back? I got lost. Um, oh, here we go. Hi again. Um, Can I so my Sorry, Kim, I yeah. think we just see the rare Adobe. So if you want to open up your slides, um, go to click, yeah, click the PowerPoint and then, yep. Yeah, the slides are done. Um, oh, so you're the done, bottom done. line is, as, <laughs> as an institution, you know, if you're, you're looking to get into this, you know, I think, again, you know, if you have your own seafood team or you, you have strong enough messaging that you've been working on, then that's great. Um, but you have other partners who have already been working on this for a long time. Again, the Aquarium of the Pacific, you've got Monterey Bay. Uh, Seafood Watch, uh, Fishwise, Environmental Defense Fund. So there are a number of options um, if that's something you're interested in getting engaged and involved in. And I would just say again, you know, to our our colleagues in the conservation world, you know, we really do I think all need to do a little bit of better of a job of not just focusing on the localized risks again that come with those general conversations about sustainable seafood. But it's time for us also to get involved in that broader conversation of seafood's role in the broader seafood supply. Um, and this is one way that we can do that. So without taking more time, I will let you guys get to the Q&A. Thank you so much, Kim. And thank you, Linda. Um, they're both really great presentations. Hopefully everyone learned a lot, and I think we have a lot of questions coming in. So um, I'll let Brianna take that over um, and start addressing some of those. Thank you, Maggie. Um, yeah, so we had a couple of questions come in while, uh, Linda, you were speaking, and I thought I'd just read those out um, one by one. So the first one was from Sam Chan. Um, he noted that local seafood, for the most part, has stayed relatively pricey during the pandemic. So Expanded consumption might likely um, be driven by health, health and sustainability. He asked, um, how can high quality local seafood be more affordable and accessible to those who may not have the income? Well, Sam, thanks for the question. Um, I, you know, when we talk about seafood nutrition for human health, um, we are talking about making that available for all income levels. And so, um, you know, talking about seafood as a whole, there is seafood for, a, you know, a dollar and up per serving. And um, on our website, um, seafoodnutrition.org, we do have some programs. Um, it was called Eating Heart Healthy, and we created a series of recipes that have um, really, like, that could serve a family of four for $10. And so we wanted to prove that um, you could definitely have seafood for an affordable um, income. And so um, granted, a lot of those recipes were using um, canned salmon, canned crab, um, things that were preserved um, versus more of the fresh options. And then for the fresh options, um, you know, we recommended for consumers 
uh, with limited budgets to really shop more seasonally. And so, you know, think about, um, you know, um, like different types of seafood that are uh, in season, like porgy. Uh, porgy can be, uh, on the East Coast here, can be um, really affordable. And so I think thinking about the different fish options that are available. Um, so there's over 500 species of seafood that are commercially available. And uh, so there's definitely a price point for everybody that can eat for affordably. Um, I also think that we need to generate demand for seafood. And so um, for all different types of seafood, so if we all rush to, um, you know, that halibut, yes, you know, there's limited supply of halibut. We have a supply and demand um, mechanism at play. And so let's also highlight some fish that are more abundant. And so if there's, um, you know, um, a, a lot of uh, hake or haddock, you know, that's actually very affordable. And so I, I think we really need to take a look at the different types of species that are available. One other note for aquaculture, since this is an aquaculture education series, the reason why aquaculture is also um, more affordable is that um, seafood farmers can plan for the amount of seafood that will be sold. And so you can manage uh, the uh, supply and demand a bit better. And so part of the reason why people can eat salmon more readily is there's been, um, you know, farm salmon made available. And so um, there's a supply and, and demand equation there. Um, but I think uh, there's also a lot of different species that we can point consumers to when they're looking at, at different variables that are important to them. I, ho I hope that helps. Can, can I just add a little bit? So, I mean, I think Linda caught it very well. We know we need to diversify, and certainly we need to retrain people that frozen a can does not mean bad. Um, I think from the conservation community and, and the education community, I think we also need to do a better job of, you know, small scale versus large scale. So, you know, the typical conversation t tends to center around if it's small scale, it's sustainable. If it's large scale, it's not. Um, the bottom line is we need all hands on deck. We need a diverse portfolio of production solutions, and that includes in seafood. And the fact is the bigger players are always going to be able to come in at a lower price point that's more affordable to a larger group of people. The more localized, they're also very important. They play a very important role, but they're always going to come at a higher price point. So um, I think from an education community, just figuring out how we can navigate those discussions and do a better job of talking about the need for all of those different scales and types of production um, is going to be useful um, in then garnering acceptance for those production methods. And that's how we get seafood to a more affordable point for more people. Awesome. Thank you, Linda and Kim. Um, I have a couple other questions that, um, if everyone's good, we'll move on to. Um, we had a question come in that uh, there's a little bit of a discussion in the chat box about it right now, but Lisa Lawrence asked, uh, could the increase in seafood consumption starting in April have anything to do with seasonality? Um, here in Virginia, April is when a lot more local seafood is becoming available. And we had a response from James, who's in Hawaii, where he said uh, he's noticed Many people have a lot more time to cook at home, so um, the fresh, super yummy fish in Hawaii um, are in higher demand as bored families at home have some more time for cooking. Um, I'll take that first, and, um, and Kim will probably have some perspective as well. You know, traditionally, seafood is eaten in restaurants. About 70% of seafood is eaten in restaurants. And so I think part of the reason why there was an uptick for seafood is that um, we saw that the restaurant industry completely shut down. And so um, everyone, you know, was really forced to begin to cook at home, maybe um, start ordering um, in more now. But at that time, the restaurant industry really shut down. And so, um, you know, there was a, a report, an article that came out of National Restaurant News they were listing the top, I think it was top 20 things that Americans miss from uh, their restaurants. And number one was Mexican food. Number two was seafood. And so I think if, if consumers are missing seafood that much from restaurants and most of the seafood was eaten in restaurants, I think that rush to uh, retail, which is what that number was showing in the uptick in April, 
I think part of that demand shifted to the the um, the retail side. Um, so that that's kind of my my take on why um, there's been an uptick there um, with retail. And Linda, do you think that some of that could also be attributed to because we're in a health crisis and because there has been momentum gathering around seafood as a healthy food, do you think that that could have played a role in that as well? I think so. Yeah, for the first time, I think, you know, um, because we're in a situation where there, uh, you know, is no vaccine yet for COVID-19 and everyone is trying to figure out how to boost their immunity, um, you know, they're looking at foods that can actually be anti-inflammatory. And so seafood and omega-3s have been known to be to have anti-inflammatory properties. And so I think that's one as well. And um, I think also um, I, I mentioned earlier in my presentation, um, I can't remember when the meat shortages started happening. I think maybe around that time, too. You know, our concerns about meat shortages and also worker safety in the in the meat sector, I think, is also opening people's eyes to different proteins that are available to them. And seafood um, is not as concentrated as the meat industry, and so um, that shift also can also be a part, a variable in terms of why seafood has really seen such a growth during this time. Awesome. Thanks, Linda. And that is actually a good jumping off point for our next question, which was from Chris Flight. Um, he was asking, are these economic trends specific to animal seafood products, or um, is it also including increased demand for algae and other seaweed products? Um, yeah, Linda, I think that was back to your slide on um, changing demand. Yeah, I... I, I want to say that that's more uh, animal protein focus. Um, so the, the IRI data is tracking um, you know, UPC codes, any food that can be um, really tracked when you scan the barcode. And, um, and so just looking at the overall volume of algae and kelp products, it's just a very small segment of the seafood food products that are being sold. Um, I know there's uh, definitely more visibility into algae and kelp um, over this time, um, but it, it, I believe most of that is um, based on animal products. I think you can answer the question. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question and uh, preface it with us that Noah cannot um, provide any of our perspective on this, but Linda and Kim, um, we're happy to hear what you think of this. Um, Slady asked, what are your thoughts on the president opening marine sanctuaries for commercial fishing versus protecting Cape Cod for ecotourism, education, and research? Kim, do you want to take that one? <laughs> I, so, you know, I, I have not looked at all the details. Um, generally speaking, we do need marine protected areas and we need uh, economic opportunity zones. Um, so how those two kind of fit, um, I, I don't know because I haven't looked at the details. Um, I do know the aquarium just signed on the letter um, in support of keeping the sanctuaries um, as protected areas. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm I'm not comfortable answering that in detail until I read into it more. Awesome. Thank I, I, just make a, I just want to make a comment that um, I think the fishing community has learned a lot about the fact that making sure that we um, maintain sustainable seafood and, and sustainable quotas and you know, sustainable fishing gear and gear type and methods, um, I would, I would um, just at some point I, I think our industry has to manage ourselves and make sustainability a priority. And so regardless of what the, you know, the orders are, um, we as an industry need to make sure that we put sustainability as front and center. And so and I guess I'm saying this from the fact that um, I'm observing other corporations um, 
uh, in their corporate social responsibility endeavors and priorities. Um, if we do not see, you know, we don't always need government to regulate what we do. Um, you know, there's different parts of society. There's government, there's corporations, and then there's, um, you know, societal organizations like nonprofits. And so all of us are playing a balancing, um, you know, measure with each other. And so if we, if we see something that needs to be done correctly, I think, Corporations have stepped up and uh, stated what they should do. And so as an industry, um, we should continue to do the right thing because we can see that with proof that sustainability helps to um, help fisheries recover and also helps us to have good seafood for the future. Um, and so um, my point, and this is a personal point, that you know, at some point we just have to take our stand as an industry and, and maybe if we don't agree it, with a regulation to um, just go with what we believe works um, for our future. Great, thank you for um, providing us with your perspectives on that. We appreciate it. Um, and uh, I have another question from Michael. Uh, he said that he gets the question about mercury often and is wondering if there's an easy publication to direct folks to, um, if either of you know of one. Uh, he said that he usually says that mercury toxicity is rare. Um, if you're concerned or an at-risk group, reduce consumption or choose uh, smaller reef fish and not tuna, swordfish, shark, et cetera. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. So um, if you go on our website, there's also um, a resource. And, um, you know, the FDA EPA have published a net effects report. Um, this is back to, uh, I believe, it's 2014 is a publication, and uh, you know we, they looked at the mercury and omega-3 levels and saw that um, really so the, the the benefits of eating seafood really outweigh the risk of mercury. I know it's, it's a really tough communications message to have, um, but this study that they did looked at the um, level if with which you have to eat seafood to actually have mercury risk. And so as an example, tuna is one of the species that they always um, look at as making sure that you don't eat too much tuna. Um, but, you know, for um, I think it was skipjack, you can have up to 56 ounces of seafood per week be before you hit mercury risk, but you're also getting the benefit for omega-3s. And so Americans barely eat, you know, two servings of seafood a week. And so you can have up to 56 ounces of seafood um, before hitting a mercury risk. As an example, for salmon, you can have up to 800 ounces of salmon per week. We, none of us, if we start eating 800 ounces of salmon per week, that's <laughs> hitting the calorie crisis. We, we should not be, be eating that many calories. And, and so... Um, when we talk about risk, we definitely need to put it in relative perspective, and so um, and, and also the guidance is for pregnant women that um, that, that should be really more concerned. Um, lastly, there has been a, a newer study that came out in the um, PLEPA journal. It's also on our website, and I can provide these links to Maggie and the team afterwards. Um, but really, um, as part of the USDA dietary guidelines process. A group of scientists um, undertook the same process to analyze um, the body of seafood research for seafood consumption during pregnancy. And what they found was that moms who ate seafood during pregnancy had babies with, on average, higher IQ of about 7.7 .7 IQ points, and so then moms that who did not, and uh, they did not find risk, uh, you know, in, in any of these studies. And so. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the USDA dietary guidelines um, sh also shares this, this finding. And so, um, you know, I think stay tuned for the dietary guidelines as well in terms of addressing this question. But um, hopefully that helps. But I'm going to share that research and um, infographic with Maggie to share back with the participants and Michael, I think it was. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Linda. Um, we just have a couple minutes left, so I wanted to make sure we got uh, maybe one more question. I wanted to also point out there's been a couple comments. Beth Walton said that um, with more time at home, we've found that more people want to learn how to shuck oysters, and then, of course, learning some new recipes as well. And thank you, thank you both. And she thanked you both for the talk. Um, and 
Sam Chan also said, um, very thoughtful answers. And based on your replies, it would be great to promote a list of affordable, seasonally available seafood like the Monterey Aquarium does. And um, then the last question I'm seeing here is from Aaron. And he asks, have you seen an increase in seaweed and kelp consumption in the US? So that's kind of along the lines of the question uh, we had a bit ago about that. I don't know if you have that data because he's um, I, you know, I, I don't have the data, um, but what I've seen is there is um, more awareness of kelp and seaweed grown in the U.S. And so, um, you know, that before COVID happened, um, you know, one of the major salad chains, Sweetgreen, had a collaboration with um, Chef Dave Chang from Momofuku, and so they were promoting a kelp bowl uh, for the first time. And I know personally during quarantine, um, and I also through the Eat Seafood America, the more I look at seafood and seaweed and different species, I've also um, been buying different kelp from Maine and, and um, have really loved it. And so I think um, um, I don't have the data in terms of just awareness, you know, how, how much more awareness people are having with, with um, uh, seaweed. But... Um, it's definitely gaining in awareness, and so maybe that's, that'll be a question we ask in our consumer surveys going forward. Yeah, I, I, I agree. So we don't have the data, and I think one thing that we really need to understand with seaweed, because there are a lot of conservation benefits and everybody's pushing this, and that's a great, um, but we have to consider some of the realities of current consumption. Um, seaweed has to be packaged in a way that's appealing to consumers. So. Um, Atlantic Sea Farms, I know, in uh, the East Coast has been doing a really great job of turning them into smoothie cubes that you put in your smoothies or in salsas or when people are making pastas out of it. Um, you know, whether or not it gets adopted in the mainstream still remains to be seen. I think as we look at seaweed, though, for its greater benefits for localized ecosystem benefits, we need to consider other avenues of uh, harvest and end uses, which are energy. Um, Hopefully one day it could be used to reduce the methane in cows, um, and then as some of those other byproducts that it's currently used for. So I think we just need to be realistic about seafood and the portfolio of uses um, so that we can leverage it for the ecosystem benefits that it can provide. Uh, but yeah, it still remains to be seen as you know, whether or not we could get consumers to adopt it more widely as a regular food item. All right. Um, well, I think that's it. Aaron says thank you. Brianna, I might have to put you on the spot if you want to answer that, or we can follow up off offline with Aaron, um, who I know Brianna has some data about um, seaweed and kelp as well. Uh, yeah, Aaron, if, if you uh, want to grab my email from the slides, uh, my PhD dissertation is on kelp farming in New England. Um, <laughs> okay. So I'm happy to, to talk about that with you. Um, nothing is published yet because, you know, dissertations, but um, I have some interesting data to, that I can share with you. So we'll, we'll send that out um, as a follow-up. All right, well, we're a couple minutes past the hour. Um, if you have any other questions uh, you'd like to ask Linda or Kim, um, please feel free to email them or me and I can forward it along. Um, we, we've, we've run out of time, so it was a really great presentation. Both, both of them were really great presentations and we've had some really great questions um, as well from the audience. So I thank everyone for um, contributing to this really great webinar today. And we're getting a lot of thank yous in the chat, so. Um, thanks, Lynn and Kim, and we'll send everyone the recording and the slides out and all those other links we mentioned soon. Um, and you'll hopefully hear from us for our next aquaculture webinar, which will hopefully be around September. So um, we'll, we'll send you all an email if you're on the listserv um, when that's happening. Thanks again, Linda and Thank Kim. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Everyone. Bye. Bye.